Governor Bush, yesterday you praised President Obama's leadership on education, yet he did not intervene when Congress voted to phase out the D.C. Opportunity Scholarship Program. What's your response to that decision? Um, I thought it was a sad decision, a horrific decision. In fact, the decision was uh, unfortunately uh, done kind of in the without being in the light of day. Mm -hmm. It was done without, it was a, it was a non-decision um, and uh, as such was was, wasn't a principal decision. I mean, it's, I, I think it's okay to disagree about the need for choice and competition and vouchers. I passionately believe it. In Florida, we have the greatest, largest number of voucher programs with students in them in the, in the country. But to, if you disagree, you ought to have the courage to say why. And we haven't heard a reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and meanwhile, you know, hundreds of families have, have uh, suffered because of it. So. Uh, I give the president high marks for taking on the teachers union, for recognizing that data matters, that we need to, the data ought to drive education decisions for student learning. There ought to be greater accountability, mm -hmm. that we should need to focus on teacher effectiveness. But um, of all the decisions he's made, or non-decisions he's made, this is probably the worst. And tell us a bit about your reforms in Florida and how, in particular, you were able to make dramatic improvements among minority students. Well, you start with the premise that every child can learn, so you don't create one standard for one group at the expense of another or excuse away the fact that lower-income families may not have the same resources to assure that their children learn. If you start with the premise that every kid can learn, then you, you can raise standards because you're, you're not fearful that some will fail. What we've proven in Florida is that the, as you raise the bar up, everybody's uh, achievement levels go up as well. We, we created an accountability system that at the time was quite radical. Now it's being applied in Indiana and it's been applied in New York City, which is we graded schools based on student achievement and we graded them A, B, C, D, and F. So there was no, uh, there was total transparency, no, no, you couldn't run and hide. If a, if a school was F, they, their, their parents would be given another choice, including a private option. And that was a catalyst for a focus on the underperforming schools. And so we saw significant gains uh, in, among low-income students. And uh, when you measure, disaggregate the data, African-American kids, for example, in Florida, uh, saw huge gains in the NAEP. Uh, Hispanic kids do better than 15 other states in the country in the NAEP, including California and many other states that are quite proud of their, their education traditions, but they haven't yielded good outcomes. So, High expectations, accountability, a focus on reading in the early grades, breaking up the system as best you can in the higher grades to make the, the learning environment more rigorous and more interesting and relevant for kids, uh, ending social promotion in third grade. It was a suite of reforms that yielded continuous improvement. That's not to say there's not more to be done, but Florida effectively has gone from the, literally the bottom of the pack to above the national average in, by most indices. And going back to the national scene, Congress is set to reauthorize the Elementary and Secondary Education Act next year. What can Congress do to improve that law and actually encourage state reforms? Well, I think the race to the top money is actually the, the precursor to the, uh, a, an appropriate role for the federal government. I'm not sure. I mean, $5 billion is a lot of dough. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would wish that there was a little more restraint in the spending up here. Uh, but to, to establish some benchmarks of what would be uh, accepted in terms of a reform-oriented grant proposal, you're going to change behavior. To the extent, for example, that if, you, if, if a state law prohibits the collection of data that connects teacher performance with student performance, which in Florida we have some states, a significant number of states prohibit the use of that, which is... Right. Uh, beyond the absurd, uh, now we're seeing states reject those laws or repeal those laws so that they can get in line and be teed up to perhaps get the race to the top money. That's a precursor to, I think, the kind of reauthorization that would be helpful. Um, there, one of the main things I think the No Child Left Behind Act could be, uh, re, uh, that would help in its reauthorization is to include a growth model in terms of learning. because. It would, it would engage all students. Um, one of the great challenges in our country is how to deal with the achievement gap. We want all students to continue to progress, 
but we can't tolerate the, this huge gaps in learning between low-income students and, uh, and everyone else. And so by changing to a growth model and recognizing that some kids start behind, but they should be rewarded if they're gaining a year's worth of knowledge in a year's time would be one effective way to improve and enhance No Child Left Behind. Governor, thanks for your time. You bet.